The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. When U.S. President Joe Biden says, as he did this week, that the United States has no closer or more reliable ally than Australia, Canadians might find themselves wondering, didn't they used to say that about us? Tonight, we'll get advice about what Canada's foreign policy objectives need to be in a world of shifting alliances. Then, Columbia University historian Adam Tooze explains why COVID-19 is reshaping the global economic order. It's Thursday, September 23rd, and that's all next on The Agenda. In a shifting world order where superpowers don't lead as they once did, does Canada know what it wants or how to get it? From trouble with China and Afghanistan to being left out of a new security pact, it's been a tough few months for this country's foreign affairs. Is it a sign of worse things to come? Let's ask. In the nation's capital, Lauren Dobson-Hughes, Gender and Development Principal at LDH Consulting. And Gary Keller, Vice President at Strategy Corp, previously Chief of Staff to former Foreign Minister John Baird. In Waterloo, Ontario, Besma Momani, Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo and a Senior Fellow at CG, the Centre for International Governance Innovation. And in Midtown of the provincial capital, Adam Chapnick, Professor of Defence Studies at the Royal Military College of Canada and Deputy Director of Education at the Canadian Forces College. And it's great to have you four on TVO tonight. We almost apparently never talk foreign policy during election campaigns. We did a tiny bit at the beginning of this last one because of Afghanistan. And as a result, let's just get us started here by reading an excerpt of a piece Lauren wrote dealing with the Afghanistan fiasco, and it goes like this. Overall, our foreign policy and development work has suffered from a lack of long-term strategic planning and coherence. Canada tends to hyper-focus on the minute details at the tactical level, but has much less ability to anticipate broader trends and challenges. It's classic Canadian risk aversion, leading to disastrous paralysis. This country's bureaucracy tends to overanalyze issues until they are so fraught that any action seems effectively impossible. Yet in crises, the risk of inaction is often greater than the risk presented by action itself. Inaction is also a risk. Lauren, can you just amplify on that a bit? Our, our typical Canadian risk aversion is getting us in trouble, you think? I'm going to answer with my original British citizenship hat on. Um, yeah, I think, you know, talking about Afghanistan, I think we can hold in one hand that many people did heroic, wonderful, important, good things and individuals. The point I was making is that they shouldn't have had to if your system of responding to crises, of which we are going to face many more in an, you know, an increasingly fractured and unstable world, if your system for responding to crises depends on stretching individual people past their max, that's not a good system. We need systemic, system-wide institutional ability to respond to what we're likely seeing is the age of a golden era over with increasingly mm. complex crises. Gary, how much, when you were working for John Baird, how much of what you just heard described did you run into on a regular basis? You know, I read Lauren's piece, and, and knowing Lauren, a little bit about Lauren's background, I suspect that there isn't a lot we may agree on in terms of, of policy uh, prescriptions. But I read her piece, and it was absolutely bang on on so many different ways. You know, official Ottawa is risk adverse. It, you know, prides uh, looking at all the options, uh, before taking action, and even then it has to be pushed and kicked and screaming to doing so. You know, I think it's a number of occasions where, you know, we were, you know, we said we should take a, a leading position on this. The minister, the prime minister want to take a leading position on this. Yeah, but what are the Brits doing? What are the Americans doing? It's like, no, we, this is a priority of the government from a foreign policy perspective. We should be taking the lead on this. And, and the number of occasions where I was, I was flashing back where, uh, you know, there were cases, I think, of a, a typhoon in the Philippines where the officials were more uh, focused on 
uh, the, the rest time for the challenger to get the officials to the Philippines rather than dealing with the crisis itself until a minister came in and yelled at somebody. And, and that was the other point in Lauren's piece is the fact that um, calling an election when the liberals did meant that the political actors needed to be focused 100% of the time on rescuing people in Afghanistan. Their attention was completely divided on the minutia and day-to-day -day of the election campaign, which meant that delays happened. The, the bureaucracy didn't have enough direct minute-to-minute -minute direction from the political masters because they were busy focused on other things. All right. Having said that, though, Besma, Lauren does write about the inability to anticipate broader trends and challenges. And I have to tell you, that is probably something that could be said about every foreign policy bureaucracy of every Western nation all the time. So are we really that much worse than everybody else on this? Well, I think at the core of it is it's about investment. Uh, quite simply, systems cost money. Uh, it's not just about, you know, uh, putting all these pieces together that somehow are not coherent enough. There's also a reality that we don't spend enough uh, on diplomacy, on foreign policy, on development. All of the core principles we want to engage with, I think, in, in terms of our rhetoric and our normative values. But when you look at the hard dollars, it's not there. And so what you what you get out of this system is exactly what you put into it, financially speaking. Um, there's so many things that need to be changed and done, including, you know, expanding the uh, uh, the human capital within foreign affairs. There's a, a real dearth of local knowledge about so many places that we're interested in globally inside GAC. I mean, you can go on and on. I think there is certainly uh, that system wide thinking is just not there enough. Absolutely risk averse. But also, this is the reality. Most Canadians don't vote on foreign policy. Most Canadians, you know, frankly, don't care about the international affairs in the same way that perhaps other countries do. So the, the politicians are responding to exactly what Canadians want, which is focus on the home front, focus on health care, focus on the environment, the economy. Um, and again, I disagree with that. And I would be happy to sort of make the case for more investment. But I just think that politicians respond to exactly what Canadians want, which is a very introverted uh, lens on the world and not really investing a lot of money. And that's to our detriment. Well, in fact, there was a big development on this front last week, and that was the announcement. And Adam, I'll get you to start on this. The United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, to the surprise of all of its NATO allies, announced this new pact. Am I saying it right? AUKUS, A-U-K-U-S, um, Military Intelligence Partnership, Joe Biden, the American president, said the United States has no more reliable ally in the world than Australia. I mean, Adam, he used to say that kind of stuff about us. What's going on here? Well, it's interesting because this announcement doesn't bother me nearly as much as, as some of the other things that the panelists are talking about. Uh, in this case, uh, Australia had a, a deal with France to buy submarines and they didn't like it. They found a better deal with the United States, uh, didn't seem to tell the French all that much about it. Uh, the, the Americans brought the British in, they signed a new pact. So they added some nice words around it to make it more than just a pact. But the French took it as a stab in the back. Um, in this case, uh, I don't want, want to see Canada in the middle of a, of a disagreement between some of its most important allies. I'm actually quite happy that we're outside of this, not that I'm surprised that we're outside of it, but this isn't one of those things where we really want to be in the middle. We need the United States, France, Australia, the United Kingdom to get along. Uh, we, we can't have them fighting, and being on one side or the other doesn't uh, get rid of this fight. No, I appreciate that. But Lauren, this seems like a fairly significant new development, a new institution in international affairs. Most of the allies seem to have been caught off guard by the fact it happened, and we're not part of it. Is that problematic? I mean, I would agree with Adam that, yes, it was what it was. No, it wasn't ideal for a number of reasons. But when you look at the last two years, it does not surprise me that you're seeing these increasingly fractured alliances. You're seeing, you know, if we start from the start of COVID, where what we needed was international solidarity and we needed some leadership. People talk about leadership in a very ephemeral, throw out the word around way. But we needed a group of people who are in charge and have been elected to make hard decisions coming together and say, this is a frightening time here's what we're going to do together, here's how we're going to get through it. And instead, we just had everybody for themselves, these very sort of tactical and self-interested trading of vaccines, for example, or short-term allegiances for domestic reasons. 
And you've seen that continue. You saw the G7 as well at odds and fractured, even without Trump in place. And so, no, it doesn't surprise me that 18 months after that, we're continuing to fracture and with these short-termist alliances for domestic reasons, it's a pattern that's likely to continue, I would guess. Gary, can I get you on that? Does it say anything of significance to the fact that we didn't know about this, we're not part of it, and yet here it is? Well, I think I'd split the difference between Adam and Lauren. I think you can't ignore that that part of this is actually about a nuclear submarine deal. There are some issues around military procurement. There's some straight business interests, dollars and cents issues around that aspect of it. You can't deny that that's absolutely part of it. But the other side of it, too, is this, uh, this area around information sharing. And, you know, for a long time, there's been accusations that Canada hasn't been doing this part. I, I read a recent part, a piece by Stephanie Carvin, who talked about Canada's involvement in the Five Eyes community, which is the three countries we've talked about, plus Canada and New Zealand. And for a long time, Australia has been uh, playing a much more leading role in information sharing and an active uh, role in the Five Eyes, maybe than Canada has been. And that, that re re requires investment and, and, and taking part in it. I think what is more concerning from, uh, from a, uh, an ally standpoint and hearing Biden's comments uh, is that increasingly there are a number of uh, regional forums around the world, whether it's the Quad, whether it's other forums, where Canada has has remained disinterested. And and my former colleague, uh, Howard Anglin, who was a deputy chief of staff to Prime Minister Harper and worked a lot on foreign policy issues as well, said, you know, uh, as Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau has shown little interest in strategic defense or geopolitics. That means that Canada's foreign policy has largely been left to the gray men and women of the Pearson building. The problem with this approach is that you stop showing up for your friends, eventually they stop inviting you. And I think that are some wise words that are, are worth considering when we talk about this new alliance. Besma, I see you nodding your head. You think we're just uh, not worth inviting to these parties anymore? Uh, yeah, sort of. I mean, you know, what are we bringing to the table, frankly? And, and I really don't think this is just about nuclear-powered subs. Um, what's on the table here is really fundamental. It's about emerging technologies. We're talking about artificial intelligence. We're talking about quantum, uh, cybersecurity, even industrial policy, talking about supply chains. I mean, this is a very comprehensive pact. And I think the fact that we're excluded says a lot. Uh, and frankly, this is not a time uh, when we should be not just only excluded, but you know, sort of shortchanging our own investment in these issues. This is the wave of the future. It is like investing in the internet, you know, 25 years ago, thinking, you know, it's okay if other people do it, you know, we don't have to do it. It's not just not that way. We need to put more into this. So I think the emerging technology piece is key. This is where we need to put more money in it. And the fact that we are excluded, uh, I think, says something about the fact that, you know, Canada doesn't bring a lot to the table. Can you follow up with this, Besma? Because I want to put that line to you that Joe Biden used in his speech at the United Nations, where he talked about this being an inflection point in history. I, I, I guess for starters, an inflection point from what to what? Well, I mean, I think he was, you know, he had several audiences at play. Certainly the one issue that he was talking about was, you know, doubling down on multilateralism, the need for multilateralism. This is really, I think, basically uh, a swipe at Trump. And, and the whole nationalist populist movement that continues to, to you know, take over the world unabated. Uh, and the fact that we need organizations like the United Nations, he was certainly, I think, doubling down on the need. He didn't provide, I think, a lot of, you know, excitement about, you know, investing in the UN. I mean, he talked about, um, you know, putting more money towards um, uh, diplomacy and uh, and helping strengthening the capacity of developing countries, which was quite you know remarkable when it comes to climate change. But beyond that, I don't think there was a lot of very interesting stuff other than the old um, usual sort of doubling down on liberal internationalism. But what I would say here is that actually what we found uh, Biden suggesting was also really about China. And, and you can say one way, look, Australia was, you know, invited into office because, yeah, this is their backyard and we need them to have the nuclear sub or nuclear powered submarines to be able to monitor the seas. I mean, they share the seas with China and so forth. And, and we're not necessarily nearly um, as concerned about that as, as perhaps Australia is. But at the same time, I think what Biden, you know, I think was trying to tell the world is that this is this is a this is a moment. I mean, he tried not to use the word Cold War. He was very careful. But, you know, China's rise and particularly under President Xi 
is problematic. I mean, President Xi, in many ways, is that nationalist, populist leader. He's got lots of Trumpian qualities in his own way. Um, and so I think this was a combined effort of really suggesting that we need multilateralism and the nationalist populists, like Xi and others, uh, need to be countered by uh, the democratic countries of the world. Adam, if this is an inflection point in history, as the president described it, is there, I don't know, in your view, is there a, a Canadian perspective on this inflection point? I think from a Canadian point of view, uh, Biden's call for greater multilateralism for countries to combine forces is exactly what we need because we can't do anything alone. We aren't effective alone. And our interests are best met when all of our allies, and we have a lot of them, are on the same page in terms of what to do. We obviously have some real problems with China ourselves and the problems we can't solve on our own. So for President Biden to say he's interested in working together with us on this, I'd like to see more action uh, behind it, but it's a good thing for Canada. And I think the key for Canada here is to match our rhetoric to our action. And I know that some of the panelists have suggested we have to therefore scale up our action to meet our rhetoric, but we could also tone down our rhetoric to match what the Canadian public is willing to invest in these issues. I don't think that should be excluded from the, uh, from the, uh, from the list of uh, options here. I think it's really important to our allies that they can rely on us, that our word is good. And if we can't match these big aspirational speeches that uh, sometimes come out of our, our governments, then we should be humble about that and clear about that and say, when we will come to the table, this is what we have, and then be steady on that. I don't think that's such a bad thing. Well, in fact, here's what you had to write in the Dorchester Review about that and other issues related to it. Ottawa's global calculus is due for a change. Adam writes, Canada's international toolkit is overhyped and underfunded. Our diplomatic corps is disillusioned and dominated by political appointees. Our military faces a cultural reckoning and overwhelming procurement challenges. Our aid budget is barely growing, even while the COVID-19 pandemic has caused global poverty to skyrocket. In this context, global followership is hardly something to be ashamed of. The world needs more responsible, reliable, secondary players. States that do their share without complaint, led by serious practitioners who do not crave the spotlight. Humility is a virtue in international politics. Let's get back to that. Okay, Lauren, let me give you the first word on that. That was uh, Adam's word in the Dorchester Review. What do you say on that? You know, I go to reliability. Sometimes, you know, when I referred earlier that not all the panelists may have the same political agreement, sometimes the most important thing is not that we agree, it's that we have a steady, consistent position and we are good to our word. And when I think about the work I do and bring it back to that human element, there are people, this is not just a policy, high level, you know, big talk conversation. There are actual people, women in Afghanistan who were funded for 10 years to work on contraception delivery and abortion access. And we put them out there and we funded them to do incredibly dangerous work. If they cannot rely on us to then protect them and have their backs, we shouldn't be saying we can do it. We need to, we should, like Adam says then, we should downscale in response. If we are not willing to fund and invest and build capacity and build a skill set within our foreign policy development community, then we should stop saying that we can do all these things. Because to our allies, the reliability and that they can trust, even if they don't always agree with us, that they can predict how we're going to respond, the ability to predict other people's positioning and responses, is probably the one of the most valuable things. Unpredictability and rash actors send the whole system into chaos. Um, well, so yeah, I really think so. Okay, let me put this to Gary then. When you were working in the Stephen Harper government, would you have been content being described, as Adam's suggestion indicates, being described as a reliable secondary player on the world stage? I think it depends, and I think it depends on the issue. I think there are certain times and places 
where that's uh, uh, the correct role for Canada to play. But I also think there's times when, when Canada can take leader, leadership positions and is actually relied on by the international community to use its standing in the world to play those leadership positions. You know, in the lead up to this election, I spoke to a lot of the diplomatic community who, you know, wanted to know the, the latest on the political intrigue and what it meant necessarily for, for foreign policy. And, you know, in talking to them, uh, you know, I asked, you know, how Canada is seen in their home countries. And, and almost virtually everyone of them said, look, everybody loves Canada. Canada is a nice place. But, you know, you don't really show up. When you show up, uh, you, you talk a lot of nice words, but you don't deliver. And a, a key example of that was the peacekeeping commitment by the Trudeau government, which has been no source of trouble for this, for this government, where, you know, we're going to be there. Yes, we're going to be there. We're going to have peacekeepers. And then it's delay, delay, delay. And when we do show up, we show up for six months or a year, and then we leave. And, you know, for a lot of the international uh, community, that's not good enough. They expect more from Canada. Um, and it takes political leadership. It doesn't help, and this is a, a hallmark of you know, conservative and liberal governments, to, to you know, keep shuffling around foreign affairs ministers. And you know, the liberals have had four foreign ministers in, in six years. And Christian Freeland, who was the longest serving one, most of her time was focused on you know, uh, the trade deal with, with the states, with, with, with Trump and dealing with and the new NAFTA, not focused on real foreign policy issues. You know, the conservatives also had a number of foreign ministers in their first couple of years. Uh, and uh, you know, when, you, when you don't have that strong, steady political leadership, it's easy for a policy drift to happen. And I really think we should uh, you know, uh, call on our political actors to, to really uh, you know, have that, that presence in our foreign ministries. If memory serves, I think one of those former foreign ministers from the Conservative Times is now the head of the People's Party. It's funny where some people end up sometimes. Uh, I want to read, Besma, to you just the last line of Adam's piece again, which said, humility is a virtue in international politics. Let's get back to that. Do you think Canadian foreign policy is not humble enough these days? Well, I mean, it's humble. I mean, back to Adam's great piece. I really thought it was a fantastic, um, you know, coverage of the issues. But look, rhetoric is cheap. I mean, some might even argue it's free, right? Uh, but action requires investment. Action requires money invested. That's where we're missing. I don't think we lack the the, the leadership or even, frankly, the capability. Uh, by that, I mean sort of the gumption to do stuff. We certainly have convening power. Everybody talks about our great convening power. Um, our reputation is stellar. Um, but at the end of the day, we don't show up with a lot. We, we show up. I mean, we'd love to join every organization available to us. You know, the joke is we join the African Union if invited, but we don't <laughs> come with stuff. We don't come with money. We don't come with resources. Um, we expect the rhetoric to take us places. Um, and that, I think, is back to Adam's point. You know, that's not humility. Don't come and offer a lot and, and say you've got a lot to offer, but then really put nothing forward. Adam, can I just understand what that means? When, when Canada shows up but doesn't offer a lot, we could improve upon that by showing up and offering what, for example? Uh, well, I would look at it two ways. One way would be to say, we're joining because we want to do X. And in order to do X, it costs this amount, and this is what we're willing to bring forward. The other way is to show up and say, we're here, but we don't have much to offer, period. And then people can adjust to the way it is. If they don't want us there, they can make that clear. If they're happy to have us there for the sake of the connections we have or the convening power, whatever smaller things we can do, that's great as well. The problem is when we say we're here to help and then people say, okay, great. And then we say, hold on. That's the real, to me, that is the issue. Hmm. All right, I wanna raise a name that, um, I think you gotta be over 60 to remember who this guy was. So. For those of our younger viewers and listeners right now, the name Mitchell Sharp may not mean anything, but half a century ago, Mitchell Sharp was a very big deal in this country. He was our foreign minister in the current prime minister's father's government, and he formulated a, um, I guess, a three-pronged strategy for Canada's foreign policy going forward. And the idea was, one, maintain an ambiguous status quo, two, firmly anchor Canada in the American orbit, or three, foster the foundations of a more independent posture on the world stage. So let's get into some of this. Lauren, half a century later, which of those three Mitchell Sharp principles do you think uh, is most reasonable to go after today? So I'm gonna declare that A, I was, I'm not over 60, and B, 
I am not from Canada originally, so. <laughs> I um, think we knew that from the accent, those who that's did, okay. Yes, to those who did <laughs> not clue in. Um, <laughs> look, I think this for me takes us to sort of, those are three clearly well-articulated goals. They are specific, they could be measurable, they could be deliverable. What we currently don't have in Canada is something like that. I have not been a fan of the kind of the Canadian knee-jerk, we need a blue ribbon panel or a national soul-searching conversation that goes on for 10 years and is headed by three Supreme Court justices. And, you know, <laughs> but I am increasingly slightly convinced of the case that Canada needs some sort of strategy like this. Pick three, any three, three or five. We always do three or five. But look at where Canada's got a value add, where it can add to the conversation. I would argue it needs to take a decolonial approach to, to that. Um, but I think, yeah, just having three specific targets, because we can't do everything, we can't lead everywhere. As much as Canadians love this kind of ephemeral leadership thing, we need to burst that bubble that that's possible on everything. And then we fund and resource the three things we say we're going to do, and we follow through on them. All right, Bestman, let me put those three Mitchell Sharp ideas to you. He offered those three options for Canadian foreign policy going forward. 50 years later, which do you think is the, the best approach? Oh, I'm going to give you a non-answer. I mean, I just don't think it's really relevant in the in the you know post Cold War world. I mean, he lived in a different time. Um, you know, I think look, we need to be nimble. Uh, we need to take on boutique issues and do it well. Uh, we're not going to do everything. We're a middle power. We have to be cognizant of our capability. Uh, but when we put our minds to one issue and do it well, then we provide, I think, a valuable service. Um, I'm not a fan of the terminology, but the feminist foreign policy is a great one. Investing in gender equity is something that needs to be done. It's not being done enough. Uh, it requires, I think, true and utter financing to do it well. Um, so we need to match it with, you know, the, the real dollars and cents that's required. And, and certainly Lauren's mentioning of, you know, abandoning Afghan women is a disaster. Um, but that's where I think we've, you know, chosen a very boutique issue and we're doing it well. I think we can invest more in it and it'll be appreciated because we know all the evidence out there, academic and policy evidence suggests that invest in women. You're investing in countries' long-term health and longevity. This is a really a a very, I think, doable project. Uh, but that's where I think we need to do is, is to really focus on one issue, two issues, do it well, don't try to be everything to everybody because we won't succeed. We don't have the kinds of resources. And keep in mind, yet again, Canadians still don't put foreign policy as the top of their agenda. So governments are cognizant of that. We can't be everywhere. Just choose the issues that I think will do the most good. Well, Gary, the uh, the reality is, every poll shows this, Canadians are simply not, and particularly during election campaigns, Canadians are not that interested in foreign affairs. I know we've had Erin Kelly on this program numerous times in which she saw, for probably the first time in ages, significant engagement on the issue of Afghanistan, but it lasted for a few days and then disappeared. So my question is, what kind of truly renewable a renewed commitment to, to Canada's place on the world stage and doing something, the boutique issues that Bestman just referred to, how is it possible to get any kind of political capital behind that when the public seems to be just not that interested in it? Well, good question, and, and I think it has to be part and parcel of a government's uh, principles. Um, to know that there may not be a large political benefit to doing this, but Canada has to stand for something on the world stage, and a government that lays out its, its, its policy priorities will, will implement and, and pursue those priorities. You know, with Afghanistan, too, while it, it, it certainly in the first couple of days of the campaign really popped up, it was less about the geopolitics and it was more directly about the competence of the government. You know, when we saw pictures of, you know, people stranded at Kabul airport and pictures of planes empty because there weren't enough seatbelts and the foreign minister saying, well, we don't know if we're going to recognize the Taliban or not. That was really like a competence issue to the, to the government's narrative overall, which is one of the reasons why I think they, they had a hit in the first, uh, the, the first few days. Uh, but, you know, we also have to, I think, recognize a couple of things. One, 
governments sometimes do make foreign policy priorities, and they should be weighed on those uh, decisions and foreign policy priorities and not accused of some sort of hidden agenda or, or some sort of, uh, you know, political um, machinations behind the scenes for making those decisions. They're, sometimes they're legitimate decisions, and you can and you can and policy priorities, and you can have that debate uh, and, and keep the politics out of it. But but you know, I think all political parties know that you're not going to likely win or lose elections or votes based on a lot of foreign policy issues. But it's part and parcel of what you do as a country and as a government, and um, and and you need to pursue your goals and your interests even if it, uh, it, it has little to no political payoff. Uh, the flip side is if you don't do that, then you're all over the map and uh, you stand for nothing. Well, okay, but uh, and with a couple of minutes to go here, Adam, I'll put this to you. We've seen from pollsters, and you have all acknowledged it here tonight, that the Canadian public, when it comes to foreign policy, that is just well down the list of their priority areas. Does that suggest that foreign policy, the discussion thereof, um, how to how to find the right path going forward. I mean, this is something that the elites are going to be worried about. The elites are going to be focused on, and that's the way it is, Adam. Well, I think we've got it a little bit backwards in that Canadians will be much more interested in foreign policy when other countries recognize our effectiveness instead of when we brag about our own effectiveness or complain about our ineffectiveness. I think the key to building Canada's reputation is to allow it to come from the outside. It happens in music as well. Canadians don't recognize their own artists until they win awards internationally. Same thing here. So my suggestion would be we shut up and act. Uh, we don't need to talk so much about foreign policy. What we need is to do things competently. Ultimately, if we do that consistently and reliably, our allies will appreciate us. It's that appreciation that will get Canadians interested, not stuff we say, because it's not as it's not as uh, legitimate. It's, it's it's you know it's baked into the political rhetoric. But when other countries appreciate us, the public might notice and start getting more curious. So I think we should be saying less talking less about principles and values and all the rest, and simply doing the hard grunt work of foreign policy. If we can get back to that eventually, that will be appreciated. Last 30 seconds to Lauren on that. Does this seem to be a government that is um, of the shut up and act variety and not boast about what they do? I think we're writing off Canadians by saying they don't care about foreign policy. There are no votes in R&D tech hubs in wherever. We do things because they matter, not because there is a micro-targeted niche identified by your data collection geniuses. I think we link local to global. We talk to Canadians about why this matters in a tangible way, why vaccine equity in Africa directly impacts their safety here in Canada. And like Adam says, we do it. Wonderful. I want to thank the four of you for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views. Lauren Dobson-Hughes, Adam Chapnick, Besma Momani, Gary Keller. Be well, everybody, and we'll see you again down the road. Great to be with you. Here's a look at something we're working on. Some people decide that, you know what, I, that's enough. I'm going back to where I came from. I'm going back to the land that may have kicked me out or the land that I've escaped and, and, and or I've decided to leave in order to, to um, offer a better standard of living for my, uh, for my children or my family. And I'm going to go home and spend the rest of my life there or the, the, you know, the final chapter. I, I, that, that to me was, it's became so fascinating because it says a lot, not just about our connection to homelands, this sort of visceral, strong, unbreakable connection to where we come from, but it also says something about adopted homelands and our relationship with them. That's coming up on the agenda. If the world was headed down an uncertain path before COVID-19, amidst four years of a very unconventional U.S. president, the arrival of a pandemic amplified that. And only now are we starting to get a sense of the global implications. Adam Tooze is a professor of history at Columbia University. His latest book is an important contribution to this subject. It's called Shutdown, How COVID Shook the World's Economy. And he joins us now from the Upper West Side of Manhattan Island in New York, New York. Professor Toots, great to have you on TVO again. How are you doing? Good to be here. 
are the outlines in your judgment of how the pandemic was handled by different countries all over the world clear enough now that we can begin to form some confident judgments about who got it right and who got it wrong? It may be premature for that because we are not done with this pandemic at this point. But we can certainly form a view, I think, of the general reaction to the crisis. And unfortunately, it's not a positive one. I mean, you have to look long and hard to find any country at this point that feels satisfied with the way in which it reacted and handled the crisis. You might single out perhaps South Korea or New Zealand. But in, on average, I think, taken as a whole, the lesson that we all have to draw is a humbling one is that even though we could understand that a crisis like this might be on its way, when it came to the crunch, when, when things got real early in 2020, the reaction was just not of the promptness and the urgency and the seriousness that would have been necessary to avoid the catastrophe of March and April 2020. Do you think there are reliable conclusions we can come to yet about how the pandemic was handled, let's say, by the United States versus Europe, versus China? Well, I think at this point it's evident that in terms of containing the epidemic, dealing with it in its first stages, the Chinese won the race. They, they beat everyone else to imposing shutdowns, controlling the pandemic, containing it within one city and one province. Obviously, they're also responsible for having failed to recognize the seriousness of the situation at the end of 2019. And they therefore found themselves in this situation of having to adopt emergency measures. But then faced with it, having identified with it, they are really the only truly large government that reacted rapidly and at the right scale. Between the Europeans and the United States, I think you'd have to say it's a bit of a toss up. It's hard to call. There have been stages when it felt as though Europe was reacting in a more concerted way, or at least parts of Europe, uh, Germany for a while, Eastern Europe for a while, whilst, of course, in the UK, in Spain, Italy, even at the very beginnings of this crisis, things were going very badly. And the United States, similarly, has been on a bit of a roller coaster in the sense that the original stage was a disaster on the East Coast. Then there was, as it were, the further disaster of the winter of 2020, 2021. But then the relative success of the vaccine rollout followed now by another wave um, in the southern states. So it's been a patchwork epidemic, I think, wherever it's hit. But neither the US nor Europe really has any reason for satisfaction at the outcome here. Well, you mentioned Germany. Let me follow up on that. There are well-known industriousness. Did that get them through it better than others? What well, seems to have helped is decentralized health management in the early stages. But then it turned out that their health administration system is incredibly creaky. I mean, the scandal of the German epidemic is that the entire system appears to rely on fax machines. And when it came to, as it were, the survivability of German society, the viability of sustaining prolonged social distancing and above all school closures, German society pro showed profound vulnerability. This is a highly advanced, one of the richest countries in Europe, which simply does not have adequate digital infrastructure. They made critical decisions five or six years ago to stick with copper wires for their telecommunication system. And this has served them very poorly in an age of 5G. So even the Germans have discovered and have, as it were, been forced to face through the pandemic, a serious reckoning with the inadequacy of their own infrastructure. Let's talk about economic after effects. Uh, I guess what's made uh, the past year and a half so extraordinary in world history is that governments all over the world decided they made a decision to put their economies uh, into deep sleep in some respects. And we faced economic meltdowns, the likes of which, um, well, may have been unprecedented in the way it happened. How much worse, though, do you think the economic crisis could have been? It could truly have been apocalyptic, I think. The pace of the downturn, the pace of the contraction of economic activity in March and April of 2020 is simply without parallel in the recorded economic history of the world. We have never seen that kind of contraction before. By the second week of April 2020, we estimate that global GDP had contracted by 20% in a matter of weeks. So that's Great Depression-style contractions, not over a period of years, but literally in a matter of days 
and weeks. 3.3 billion people worldwide, that's about 90% of the global workforce, were under one or other type of constriction, uh, limitation, social distancing regulation, or, or just outright furlough. The education of our young people collectively worldwide came to a standstill. So the long-term damage from that will be grievous. But it could have been even worse if there hadn't been the huge central bank and fiscal policy taxing and spending measures put in place across the world, not just in the rich countries, but in many middle income emerging markets as well. Well, let me follow up on that. What, in your view, were the single most important initiatives undertaken to have made the catastrophe you just described more manageable? Well, the, the one which, as it were, we could not have survived through to April or May without was the spectacular intervention by the American Federal Reserve in the market for US Treasuries. This is really the piggy bank of the global financial system. And it was not working in March. Not only were prices and interest rates moving in really perverse directions, prices were going down, interest rates were going up, but you couldn't transact, you couldn't sell portfolios, you couldn't sell holdings of treasuries into the US market. And that is a disaster for the global financial system. If that had been allowed to continue, we wouldn't really have gotten through to April or May without major bank failures and other types of financial meltdown. But beyond that, what mattered most clearly for the vast majority of people was the ability of societies, both rich and middle income, to sustain people during the shutdown, to enable them, as it were, to have a degree of life support whilst ordinary business, ordinary work was interrupted. And in Europe, we saw um, various types of short-time working system adopted in Australia, I believe in Canada as well, uh, on a model that the Germans had pioneered in 2008-9, which saved people from the huge insecurity of immediate unemployment, which is what folks suffered in the United States. They, in turn, were helped by the rapid emergency improvised rollout of a kind of ramshackle unemployment insurance system. So those were the sorts of measures which by the summer mattered most for most people worldwide. It's always a bit dangerous for historians to say, as a result of all this, it has ushered in the end of dot, dot, dot. But it does raise the question, given the big government response, regardless of whether governments were democratic, Republican, liberal, conservative, has it hastened, in your view, an end to the thinking that neoliberalism can solve all our problems? I think certainly it's ended that kind of thinking. The question of whether it really will end the practice is another matter. I think neoliberalism as a body of coherent economic doctrine is dead. And this is really, as it were, the stake in the in the undead body of, of neoliberalism in that respect. I think it's difficult to see it coming back. The fact of the matter is, though, that the vast majority of the, these massive interventions that were mounted last year were really there to underwrite society as we know it. And that society itself has, of course, been shaped by the impact of now basically half a century of policies that were orientated towards small government and the market, the structures of inequality, the patterns of who owns what, where, and which minorities benefit most from this sort of measure. Those were all reinforced, replicated, in a sense, continued. And that's really one of the sort of ironic legacies of 2020 is that these gigantic policy measures were adopted really to keep everything in place. It's a sort of extraordinary conservatism uh, that things should remain the same. Everything at that moment had to change. And in that respect, I think uh, continuity is the name of the game here. Were there any governments around the world, in your view, that used a neoliberal approach to fighting the pandemic, laissez-faire, hands-off, more market approach, uh, not using the central bank the way you just described, and who had success with it? Well, the two countries that really stand out, and it's a bit of a puzzle, really, are Mexico and India. I mean, we did find ourselves in the situation in 2020 in which Mexico, a supposedly left-wing administration in Mexico City, was taking lessons from the IMF on the need to increase its fiscal response. And I think the result in Mexico is quite clear. We saw a surge of poverty there, alleviated above all by the spillover effects from the American stimulus. So Mexico is famously, you know, too far from God and too close to the United States. And in this particular instance, it benefited to a degree from that stimulus. Remittances to Mexico surged. India initially saw virtually no response. And as a result, 2020 became a catastrophe for the poorest Indians, of which there are hundreds of millions. So much 
so that by the beginning of 2021, the Modi administration had had to change tack. But they really are the outliers. This was a crisis which across most of the world, as it were, solicited a clear understanding that really government had to help, the state had to intervene here. Let me pluck a quote out of your book in which you describe this as an exceptional and transient crisis, no doubt, but also a way station on an ascending curve of radical change. What is that radical change that you see coming around the corner? Well, I cleave to the view held, I think, by many epidemiologists and virologists, that this is just the beginning of a surge of mutations of increasingly dangerous epidemic diseases that will be generated by our unbalanced relationship with nature. They've been predicting this sort of crisis for some time. We've had forerunners. We had the SARS experience. We had the swine flu moment. We had MERS. There's every reason to think that there's more and more dangerous things coming down the pike. And to that extent, 2020 is a sort of test run and an overture, a preface, if you like, to what may be a new era of challenges of a dimension that we've never faced before. In some ways, this is even more radical and more fast moving than climate change, because potentially rather than affecting a huge region like a giant hurricane does or a drought, this potentially affects literally everybody on the planet. A test run. The past year and a half you think could be a test run? Absolutely. I think this is the sort of crisis that we need to understand the potential of, and understand that next time it could be even worse. And we're not done with this one yet. After all, the Delta variant is the result of this disease continuing to move through the global population. It continues to do that at an extremely elevated and dangerous rate. We do not have a program to fully and rapidly vaccinate all 7.8 billion of us. And as a result, we are basically riding our luck, even with this epidemic let alone with pandemics to come. And this one is one or two mutations away from being a far more lethal disease than it is. But Bill Gates is absolutely right to say that this pandemic risk is the one that could actually claim the lives of a billion people on this planet um, in the future. If you look back to the 17th century, in that century, a third of the world's population succumbed to a combination of climate change, in that case, global cooling, and the pandemics that ripped through Eurasia and Latin America and North America in that period. So yes, this I think has to be seen as the harbinger, as a forerunner of a new era of comprehensive global crises. Well, every time you mention Bill Gates or Anthony Fauci, there are a sizable number of people in the United States whose heads explode because they're convinced that this is something that those two gentlemen have orchestrated in order to enrich themselves. Which simply gets me to a question about if this was a test run, and this is about to become a more newish normal for us going forward. How in heaven's name do we work our way out of it when there are so many people who simply don't believe why it happened? I agree that this has tested the limits of public rationality, might, you might say. It requires us to mobilize a strange combination of, as it were, scientific skepticism and commitment to rationalism on the one hand, and on the other, at critical moments, simply to trust the judgment of people who clear, clearly know far better than we do. As in, for instance, Dr. Fauci, who may have changed his minds about face masks um, over the course of the crisis. But then, as John Maynard Keynes feignably observed, what do you do when the data change? I change my mind. And it's navigating that terrain, which is a huge challenge for public discourse, for all of us involved in the making of public opinion, to convey the necessary combination of, as it were, skeptical commitment to the values of critical scientific inquiry, and on the other hand, at critical moments, a willingness to simply do as we're told, because that is the efficient and quick way to move through this crisis. I agree, however, that there are depressing conclusions to be drawn from the current moment. Um, one upside, I think, is that there are very few things that are more effective in convincing people that vaccines are important and work than immediate exposure to a lethal infectious disease. We see far lower rates of vaccine skepticism in the populations of low-income countries and emerging markets who are clamoring for access to this vaccine than we do in some of the rich populations 
populations of the world. In any case, because this is an infectious disease and it works through contact, the crucial thing is to get 60 to 70 percent of the population safe behind a wall of immunity and then to ramp up the capacities of our healthcare systems to deal with the fallout from our inability to reach everyone and to deal with the breakthrough infections that we're bound to have. It's about increasing our overall tolerance. It doesn't require total conformity by 100 percent of the population. It requires simply a critical mass to reach that level of immunity to put us all out of harm's way. Understood. Let me pluck another excerpt from your book and uh, raise a question emerging from that. The future challenge, you tell us, laid down by 2020 seems clear. Either we find ways to turn the billions invested in research and development and futuristic technologies into trillions, Either we take seriously the need to build more sustainable and resilient economies and societies and equip ourselves with the standing capacities necessary to meet fast-moving and unpredictable crises, or we will be overwhelmed by the blowback from our natural environment. Uh, I know you touched on this, but I think we need to be a little more specific about what you think that blowback looks like and when it might happen. Well, it takes many different forms, and there are two which are top of stack right now. One is the climate crisis, which is ongoing. It's not something about the future. It's something that's already happening in large parts of the world, whether in the form of drought or extreme weather of other types. And the other one that we've so far encountered is pandemic disease. We will also in future be dealing with uh, the wide and ramifying consequences of the loss of biodiversity. We are dealing in many parts of the world with desertification of essential agricultural land, which is crucial for the global food supply, especially as the world's population shifts and moves gradually up towards 10 billion, where we hope it will stabilize. And finally, we have to deal with the extraordinary and awesome implications of massive levels of pollution, the most dramatic element of this perhaps being the pollution with plastic of large parts of the world's oceans. All of these are, as it were, constantly produced by our own behavior. And given the obstacles to concerted collective action, given the extreme divisions within our politics, particularly in the West, it seems to me that science is our best hope. Science and technology are the silver bullet. We can't necessarily persuade everyone to take the vaccine, but we don't need to. We need to get 70% to do so. And in that case, the crucial thing to do is to seriously invest in the pipeline of innovation, of scientific solutions, of pharmaceuticals that will deliver us those solutions. We need to upgrade our ability to sequence genomes. We need to multiply the number of labs we have. We need to move from a situation where we're not certain that we can do coronavirus vaccines to a situation in which we're routinely developing them just in case, constantly mapping the range of viruses that are out there and building the kind of reserve capacity that, that we would need to produce vaccines at an adequate scale, and we're talking 8 billion doses of vaccine in a matter of months. We need not one serum institute in India, but we need six of them dotted around the low income and emerging market world so that they can all ramp up production simultaneously. Now that's investment and that costs money, but this is money well spent. This is what, what would be better, as it were, to build a world of labs a world of research institutes and pharmaceutical production capacity. This is good stuff to be spending money on, and the estimates of the cost involved are not astronomic by the standards of modern financial markets. Hundreds of billions of dollars spread over a period and around the entire world will do the trick, and it would be money well spent. Let me follow up on that and ask about money well spent, because, um, well, I'll just put it in, these, these numbers will seem small to you as an American, but for Canadians, they are um, astonishing. I mean, our government's traditionally ran deficits of about $30 billion annually uh, for several years until this past year when the government of Canada introduced a budget deficit of $345 billion, which was so astronomically off the charts of anything anybody could imagine. Our national debt is now north of a trillion dollars. And, and I guess two things. Number one, are we ever going to be able to pay that money back? Well, no, because the crucial thing is with public debt is you don't have to because the Canadian nation, which effectively owes that money to itself, is infinitely lived. So this isn't like a household where you and I have a mortgage and as you're getting on in life and you move into middle age, you suddenly begin to size up the timeline of that 30-year mortgage and you realize, well, you know, you need to step, get going on paying it down. A national debt is a community debt owed by a community which is 
infinitely lived. In the Canadian case, is continuously expanding through demographic growth and through immigration. And so that debt will be spread over time and over successive generations. And if what it's doing is paying for Canadian society to get through a historic shock like this so that life can continue and what's called the scarring in economy and society is not too grievous so that people can maintain their homes and continue supporting their children and their children's education, then again, this is money well spent. This is a, this is a burden that will, as it were, ultimately be sustainable in terms of Canada's long run economic growth. And in any case, is there any sign at all of stress? The sign of stress you'd expect to see is that interest rates are, are nudging up as you borrow more. And the reverse is the case across the world, even though we have engaged in gigantic borrowing, because there has also been a huge surge in saving during the course of the epidemic and vast amounts of money that were unspent that needed to be put away. Um, the, the debt has, in a sense, funded itself. There is very little sign to date of any stress in any of the major debt markets worldwide. In which case, how important a question is it, do you feel, that needs to be answered, which goes something along the lines of, yes, we undertook an enormous amount of debt, and some of it was probably pointless spending, some of it was probably sloppy or bad, or who knows, even fraudulent spending. Is it important to understand the distinction amongst all of that? It's worthwhile, of course, and a government which engages in large-scale spending should clearly be accountable. And it's profoundly regrettable if people take advantage of this kind of public largesse because it discredits it. But I find it very hard to believe that Canada will be unlike anywhere else uh, in, the, in the sense that those kind of elements of the spending are, are trivial by comparison with the overall effect. And furthermore, if the aim of the game is to stimulate the economy and keep things going, unless the people engaged in this kind of devious behaviour bury the money in their back garden. It, in fact, flows back into uh, the national economy in any case. So though in the first case, it's clearly a regrettable misappropriation and misuse of the funds, it's A, small, and B, overall, it will nevertheless generate some degree of stimulus because the folks will spend it on groceries or a new television um, or on childcare or whatever. And in that case, the money flows back. Of course, though, any kind of public body which spends money on this scale must be accountable and rigorous inquiries should be carried out and checks and, if necessary, sanctions imposed. You always give us so much to think about, which is why I'm so grateful that you continue to take our calls and appear on our program. Adam Tooze, history professor. His latest is called Shut Down, How COVID Shook the World's Economy. And we're grateful that it's brought you to us from New York City today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And that is the agenda for Thursday, September 23rd, 2021. Ontario's proof of vaccination policies kicked in this week. And tomorrow, Nam Kiwanuka will find out just how it all works. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org. And Nam, we'll see you tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.